and we are here. Hey. Hello. This is Diane Klinko, and I have Robert Berry with me. We're going through the um, process right now of bringing him up, and he should be here right now. Robert, do you see yourself yet? Are you, are you talking to me? I'm talking to you. <laughs> I, uh, I do. I see myself, but it's on my iPad here in the studio. So, yeah. Okay. So this is as painful as taking pictures. Yeah, I see myself. <laughs> I hate taking pictures, Diane. You know that? I mean, you do an album and you have to take the photos and go, oh, God, you know. What about those apps they have on the phone that makes you look really like a cartoon or something? And they don't have those for professional cameras. <laughs> something besides us that look like, well, you know, <laughs> it'd be nice to have a cartoon kind of thing. That's for sure. Okay, so here we go. We are live. We are um, being recorded. So welcome everyone. And we are so happy to have you here. Uh, I cannot see uh, Robert, but it could be just due to the fact that I don't have the gallery up and running like I want to. So as long as Robert can see both of us. Um, I can, I, yeah. Um, let's see. So Robert, how so are you? Diane. <laughs> I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing absolutely excellent. Getting ready for Christmas. What? What's? Oh, that's Christmas. That's right. Yes, that's coming up in a couple of days. I want to say to you that I am so sorry that technology got in our way the other day because you weren't stressed. You were hanging it really well, but I know it was a stressful situation and you do such good work and you're so kind to everybody and you're in one of the females in the prog world come on how many are there you can count them on the uh, fingers on about 250 hands you know but that's, i felt bad and you made it happen this time so that's pretty cool i did and i'd like to double, hello everyone from terry uh let me see i always have trouble with some last names that are long schwartz and walder oh, you're supposed to be social distancing you have all those people in your house I know. I know. <laughs> My house, you know, your studio is going to be packed. You know, not to talk about the studio, but since March, when we kind of got shut down, my business has been maybe 75 to 80% of normal. Um, I've done a couple albums worth of work on my own, so I couldn't totally pack it, but I'll only do one artist at a time. Um, so it's just them and me. It's a big place. You've been here. There's booths that they're worried about it. They can go in a booth and never even see me or anything. I spray it down every day, morning and night, depending on who's, you know, been in that day with the isopropic alcohol. I've made it really safe. I've had a great year down here and people have been doing the thing they love, music. And there's so much struggle in the world emotionally and stuff that it's it's been really a good year for me as far as the studio. It's made me really happy and the people that come in happy. I'm and uh, I for that. Um, we have, uh, just in, interrupted for a second, we have Robert uh, Schind Schindler. This is Hi Kids. And we have Joe Thompson. Good afternoon. All Merry Christmas. You know, I'd get rid of all, I think they're all communists. I'd wipe them right off there right now. It just sounds like the wrong, a bad group. A bad bunch. <laughs> no, I'm really happy to. Some names, I, I recognize some of those names and the good people out there that um, have not only, like I said, you know, you saw on tour, I walk out the first thing I say, I got to thank you people. You're my people, the Prague people, the people who have supported my music so I can make a living in music and still do what I do. Um, you know, and I, I was saying that kind of medium level you know I never made it like a, a yes or all that but it keeps me hungry it keeps me working it keeps me striving to be better and I feel I'm kind of lucky being bubbling under the uh the Steve Howes of the world the Keith Emerson's you know you really are you know to be fortunate enough to have, have a career 
that you really love. Do, I mean, how many of us are doing a job that we either can't stand or sure wish we were doing something different? Well, hopefully the jobs, they, it's not they can't stand them, it just doesn't inspire them and, and they're making enough money to do the thing they do love if you're a painter or a musician, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. Sometimes, I mean, look at it this way. I did a thing for Disney a week and a half ago, narration. Now, you know, they're in narrating and, you know, talking and I'm pushing the buttons. Then it took me, the guy did, for an animated thing comes out next year, I think, did um, three pages of copy, which isn't much. And it took me 12 hours to edit it up there. I'm sitting there cutting up the words. Sometimes there's four the same line and they would tell me which one they liked the best, but we have to save all the bad ones too. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sitting, spending like about 14 hours of my life doing that. So even my, what I do for my daily Monday through Friday job has things that aren't the most fun, but you know, it's all part of making it where I can tour. I mean, it's expensive, you know, to, to be a musician. <laughs> It is very expensive, and sometimes the payoff from that is very low. You know, I, I always tell people that come in, especially, I, I do um, a lot of the young, like 18 to 22-year-old female artists, their first recording. I'll, they'll come in and I'll do their music. If it's hip-hop, it's rock, whatever, it's their Sheryl Crow or their Fannie Mae, you know? Um, and I'll say, you know, you're going to fail every day as a musician because you have these dreams, and it's hard to get. But that one time a year that something is positive, it'll float you the whole year. It only takes that one positive thing, you know, when you're following your dreams, so. That's so true, isn't it? Now, you know what? We have Bruce O'Sullivan that says Merry Christmas. Great. We have our Rolf, uh, Remla, Lemon. There goes, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> he says the same thing you and I said. Robert, who? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, you're a scream. <laughs> Love it. And uh, Terry uh, Schwarzenwalders comes back and says, Happy holidays. All right. Very good. That's great. We're getting a lot of people that are coming on now. And um, in fact, um, you have a couple of Big things coming out. Lucy, RV, Kratz, and Lori say Merry Holidays. Isn't that nice? You know, it. you think people say, so what's with this new song and video? That's crap, you know? <laughs> you gotta but, those holidays. No, I love it because, you know, for this year being such a hard year. Yes. All yeah. of us for our own reasons. <clears throat> pardon me, for our own reasons and for um, our joined reasons. Um, it's been a very hard year. It's, it gets frustrating. We get, um, uh, what do you call it, cabin fever, um, everything. And yet people are coming out and they're making sure our holidays do not change. That we're... Yeah. Wishing. Yes, and I wanted to say that, and you even went through sur surgery, right? On top of all this, you have some surgery done. Yes, I did. Yeah, I hate to bring, but, but it's been that kind of year, you know? 2020 is the kind of year you want to look back and say, I don't remember any of it. <laughs> None of it. Gone. No, I just want to get so past it so badly. Now, Wolf sent up your YouTube video, a fond farewell. You know, I was gonna um, start by talking about the December people video that's out because everybody's wishing me a Merry Christmas, but I gotta say the fond farewell video, I have to give credit to my record company. I, I'll tell you my idea for the video and what they said. I had three big screens behind me while I'm singing, while I'm playing the mode, whatever it was, and they all had cards on them because Actually, the song Fond Farewell is about saying goodbye to kindness. You know, when when I was young, I wouldn't say, I, I believe I could say shit, right, on the internet. I wouldn't say that in front of my parents. 
And then I wouldn't say a lot of things, right? But especially the F word, let's say that wasn't even thought of. Now, the kids, my son, you know, the 20 or something, 30 somethings, F is like the word, right? Oh, and, no. But I remember the first time, I think it was in the eighth grade, when it slipped out. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah, you couldn't say that. But but now they say it, and it's it's like it's like saying shit back, you know, when in in the seventies, whatever. So my whole thing, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, people are so mean, and they're I don't know if they're conscious of what they're doing on the internet, what they're saying when they're faceless and all this. How? And I thought, oh my god, you know, I wouldn't say the f word to my parents, and now. I even say it sometimes. Sammy Hager taught me to say it. <laughs> so <laughs> he says it all the time. But my point being, we if we say goodbye to kindness now, like we are in 10, 15, 20 years, will that be the norm? And it really kind of hit me and went, oh my God, you know, because everything's accepted more and more as we go along. Things get looser and looser and looser, and everything's okay, right? No problem. It's okay. But I don't think we want to say goodbye to kindness, do we? You know, the respect for the elders and knowing that these words are unacceptable to your elders and parents, um, it makes it, um, I think, kind of sad that that part of it has disappeared. Remember way back when when you go to the front door to see your friend and you'd be like, you know, hi, Mrs. Smith. Can you come out and play? And now it's, yeah. hey man, you work around? <laughs> well, now we text our kids in the next room. You know, my son's here at the studio working with me. And I text, hey, Robert, what about, you know, when I could just walk out there and talk to him. Oh. So the song's about saying goodbye to kindness, really. I hope that that doesn't happen. I hope we have a reboot of our senses. We realize what we're doing. So I was going to have these three things behind big screen TV, like big, big ones. And playing cards are going to come up. Actually, I was going to have five of them because I had to do a full hand or a full house, whatever it's called. I'm not a gambler. Well, I guess I am a musician. But um, so, you know, I, and I was saying something, maybe not that I wanted to use Hitler, but it'd be a, like two Hitlers and a Stalin was, you know, some kind of card hand. And then all of a sudden there'd be something positive back there and the lights would light up the whole thing. And that wasn't the whole part of the video, but it was like, the, I thought the interesting part to show where how easily we can accept things. So I sent the thing to the record company and they say, we hate that, <laughs> right? And when I look back at what they did and what my idea was, I kind of hate my idea too. They <laughs> said, do you mind if we try something? I said, no, and what, what do you have? They're in Italy, you know, Frontiers Records. They came up with, I think a really cool idea, even though it's not about kindness, it's about, boy, if we keep getting meaner and say goodbye to everything, you got to go to the space station if you want to, you know, live and be happy. And all of a sudden the thing blows up and this one guy's left. Oh, my God. You know, I mean, they're way past what my song was about, but it still had the same feel. And I was so happy with that video. Also to that song that they picked that again, they picked that we got to put that out first. That's we really like that big keyboard sound and it's in seven, you know, and I was, OK, because an artist is the last one to know what the best thing on an album is, right? We're so deep in it, we can't even think. So they picked the song, they did the video, and I had to run it past Rolf to make sure everything was okay because I can't make a move without him, you know? Oh, he's, he's just... Rolf, you're in charge, you're the boss. <laughs> oh yeah, he's he's the boss. And <laughs> anyway, he uh, oh. Rolf's been a great, great friend and a, a great, part of this whole three and 3.2 thing. But anyway, so that's where Fond Farewell came from, what it means, that's how the video happened. I'm so excited that they took the sci-fi route because see, I'm the only prog guy that's not a Star Trek fan. I mean, I don't mind Star Trek, but I'm not a big fan, right? And they hit it right on the head. Sci-fi and prog goes together. Yeah. Hello, yeah, good stuff. Um, Frank, um... Now I got a, I got a almost spell this one. Oh, it's German, isn't he? Oh, that guy. I want to say he's um, have, sending greetings from Germany. Yeah, you got to watch him. He's a sneaky guy. You got to watch him. 
Yes. Uh, Frank, we welcome you and are so happy that you're joining us from Germany. This is very yes. exciting to get people from around the world to um, tune in and get to know Robert better and uh, hear what he has to say. We've got some fun stuff to talk about. You Don't know. ask Frank. Don't I ask Frank about Mustang cars. You, the whole thread's going to go down. He's He'll start in. Trust me. Okay. Well, Rolf also says, checks, checks still in the mail. <laughs> Is that the one to him or the one to me? <laughs> no, that's a good question. <laughs> Rolf, are you expecting a check? <laughs> <laughs> Is Robert getting behind? <laughs> oh, you know, that's something, Diane, funny you say that, because one of my pet peeves is people paying their bills on time, and I try to pay people right away, because I think it makes them, even if they trust me, it makes them super comfortable, and if I say, hey, can we do this, they know that if I owe money, it happens, you know, in Rolf's case, I owe him so much money, I can never pay him, so I just said, forget it. <laughs> well, Rolf says, uh, Mustangs and chickens. Ah, there you go. There it is. You know, you also have a great album that I heard um, your first release of um, the song, and it's from the new album, The Power of 3.2. Now, is, are you talking about the last album, which is The Rules Have Changed, the or, the last, or the new album? The last album, The Power of 3.2. Well, the, the Power of 3 was the first album with Keith, Carl, and myself. Right. The, ru the Rules Have Changed, which is a title I came up after we lost Keith because I went, oh, my God. Yeah. Um, it was so such a struggle for me. And all of a sudden, that song, and it came out. I went, oh, wow, that's got to be the title. That was the second album, which is the first time when Keith and I decided to use the 3.2 moniker, which is... The second version of three, the two of us doing it, Carl didn't want to be involved. He was so busy, you know, it was not, he gave us our blessing, this blessing, but um, so for all kinds of reasons, it was the, to me, the second album in the three series. And that's why this one's called Third Impression because I felt that I wasn't gonna do a third one. The record company says, people really loved it. You gotta do one more. I had one more song left that Keith and I wrote. It was too long for the last album. It's called Never. It's almost like a couple seconds off of 10 minutes. It is classic Emerson, especially in the middle solo sections. It's just really great piece. It could be the best of the bunch uh, next to Desi Levita. I mean, it is really a great song. I should have put on the last one, but it, it just kind of didn't fit. You know, it was just too much. And so when they said, we really want you to do this, I thought, you know, if I finished that piece and then, of course, I thought there should be three albums for the band three in, in terms. And people say, well, this isn't really the band three, except for that I was the singer of the band and sort of half the writer. Mm -hmm. So I am the only one that could sort of carry the torch and, and complete that. So I don't feel disingenuous about it, but I am using this also as a transition kind of to what I'll do in the future. So half this is classic three sounding like Fond Farewell, but has a, a tougher kind of rhythm because we were, you know, Keith and I wanted to have a stronger rhythm. And then half of it is a little more like maybe GTR, it has a little more guitar in it and keyboard mix. So I'm wondering what people are gonna think. Now, I will tell you, and I shouldn't tell anybody this because Rolf's gonna get in trouble, but Rolf has heard the whole thing. I couldn't put it out without checking with him um Man. just because i was so worried oh, oh no an album's gonna come out what are people gonna think oh my god so rolf didn't talk to me for two days i think it was i said rolf what's going on <laughs> rolf help what what do you think i'll have to let him type that on the, the thread because <laughs> we'll see if i owe more money <laughs> does he owe you <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. If he puts up a dollar sign, then you know the review's not coming out till I pay him. 
<laughs> well, I'm waiting to see from him. Let's see what we have here. We have a couple more things. Uh, Frank uh, Moltrecht. I think I'm pronouncing the last name right. And Frank, I apologize if I'm not. Oh, Robert Berry. This is mouthwatering. <laughs> Frank said he is, he used to call himself my only German fan, I think, or, or the head, the top German fan. Uh, and Frank and I had had many conversations in, uh, you know, I was supposed to go to Germany last, actually this year. I'm trying to put it behind. The European tour is supposed to happen. Going to Germany, hoping to get picked up at the airport in a Mustang. And um, Rebecca has a, a boy that she raised mm -hmm. in her past life, um, who was an exchange student and thinks of her as his mom, who's a German guy. Martin's fantastic guy. Um, hoping to see meet him in person for the first time, too. And then uh, I forget what it's called. Some kind of virus or something. hit. I don't know. It's no big deal. But I can't think about it. I can't remember the name. Oh, yeah, COVID. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> not to make, not not to joke about it, but you know, um, the quicker we can put it behind us, the better, which we're hoping. Anyway, um, I was going to go Italy, uh, Netherlands, uh, Germany, uh, England. I mean, all over. And what was nice for me was the first time, as uncomfortable as I am having my name in the marquee. I'm more of a team player. I'm a band guy. I like to work with you know, Andrew Collier and Jimmy Keegan, Paul Keller. I love that. And you saw it. You know how good they are. Oh, it's still... Amazing musician. Just yeah. amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't ask. I mean, they played the this, this stuff tremendously. And they all sing, you know? I mean, you've got all kinds of backup in there. And uh, yeah. what um, Jimmy did... Um, Part of, I believe, uh, uh, Carnival Mind. Yeah, I, I mean, and Andrew, of course, are playing Jordan Rudis's parts based on Keith, which is even harder than Keith's parts. I was like, oh my God. And he did it. Figured oh. that, what do you see? I was oh, well. talking to him and I go, how do you do, you know, two different keyboards? You've got a computer to watch. Yeah. You've got something in front of you here, a screen to watch. You've got all these pedals on the floor. <laughs> and you've got this long thing that I can't remember the name of it. But That just, that sounded wrong. Because I was going to bring that up, that that's what he uses to push the pedals with. Oh. oh. <laughs> I love the way he just, like, brings his hand across like that. And then you can hear it. Yes. And he boards and it's like. Man, this is as close to Keith as you're going to get. I mean, Andrews is such a talented man, and he's got yeah. his own band, Circuline, that is absolutely amazing. Any prog person needs to check that out, too. Did, did you see the post when we were in New York and he was taking his vitamins? Did you ever see that that I did? Uh, probably not. It was early on before the tour started. Mm -hmm. and. I'm over there and we're taking a break from rehearsal and he has, I'd say 25 vitamins. So I go with my camera. Oh, here's Andrew's taking his vitamins. I said, what, what do you got going there? I thought it'd be interesting. Right? So I put my FaceTime on. He goes, well, this one is for the heart and this one is for, you know, the, the little toe. Here's one for the big toe. And then after about eight of them, he goes, and this one is to help you with the other vitamins. I said, well, so let's stop right there. I said, that's a vitamin for the vitamins he goes yeah well you know it can take a lot in your stomach all these vitamins so you have to take a pill to i said in that okay i'm gonna cut this off that just seems way over the top that's andrew he is over the top he's such a great musician um he's a doctor you know fantastic nice guy you know um really dedicated uh, we're working on the prog stock live dvd right now and uh he you know, calls me asking about this and that, what's going on, and he stays on top of things, and it, really an asset to a band, really. He's such a great guy to talk to. You know, when I met him, I was just like, I was so impressed. I felt like, oh, I found a friend. You know, I mean, that's just how he talks to you. Just so warm. Yeah. Yep. And um, really good guy. Warm. Rolf is back. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> 
he says to you um, when we were talking about money, uh, he's, yes. he's selling coffees on eBay. He, you know, Rolf, um, I, I, if I remember right, he has some of the vinyl albums where the edges got damaged a little bit. He goes, you know, I'll put them on eBay so people who want to, don't want to spend as much money, they get them cheaper. I said, okay. You know, because then shipping, sometimes the cardboard gets banned. It's not a big deal, but um, people want pristine ones. I still have, you know, I have 300 of those. I've sold 200 because I haven't really pushed it hard. I thought only the people that really find it uh, can order the vinyl from me. And I sign out and I have a special three guitar pick and this you know, postcard of all the stuff on it. And I don't want to push it like I'm the vendor for the, the Rules of Changed album. So I pressed 300, the record company let me do it myself because I wanted it to be hands-on and I've sold 200 of them. But I, I don't even know how many were, were sort of damaged. Rolf might have five or six. I thought, well, great, you know, put them out there. Why not? I think we'll be talking. <laughs> I don't have that yet. <laughs> um, that's definitely something that I would be interested in. But Rolf comes back and he says, great album. Third impression, every song is well constructed. Robert Berry meet, uh, meets Prague in 2021. Head on. That's right, Rolf. You just keep, keep them going. Because that's, that's no. exactly it. Oh, look at all here. Oh, here it comes through on my phone. There's Rolf's invoice. Yep. He, he wants <laughs> three thousand dollars, Rolf. What? <laughs> Rolf, you, you you take you take no uh, no side steps now. It's just boom. <laughs> you know, he, he Rolf is uh, not only very very intelligent and a great musician, but his sense of humor is really special. Love, I get a kick. Yeah. I love it. You know, I uh, have, have uh, talked to Rolf you know, kind of briefly on, yeah. on Paul's um, Patreon page. Yeah. And yep. um, Paul uh, runs like um, different, uh, different things like uh, Sunday's a silent movie and right. gives you uh, information and whatnot. So um, yeah. That's here's what I'd like, here's what I'd like to do because I can't do it. Could you pronounce Paul's last name for me? Uh, <laughs> me oh, that was throwing you under the bus, wasn't it, Diane? <laughs> let me try. Uh, Bella, Bella, um, Bella, uh, Bella Magosi, I think it is. Bella, it's, it's, something like that, I think. Paul B. Paul B. What a great, talk about nice people and great musicians. He is amazing. We, I did an interview on his show with him and I couldn't stop talking about him and what he does with Carl. And uh, he is really he's so, amazing. He's so easy to talk to. I mean, you can ask him about anything and he just puts it right out there. Like it's, he has his whole heart out there you yeah. know, for, um, for anybody that'll listen. And it's just so wonderful. Really, really great musician. I think he's amazing. I think it's amazing. I think I've done a Q and A with him now twice, and um, lots of fun, lots of fun. Yeah. Oh, by the way, everyone who's um, putting out there, um, putting out there on the feed, don't forget you got a challenge, Robert, because he's pretty sharp about a lot of things. Huh. But huh. Or there's got to be something out there that somebody can ask that'll make them really have to think. So they really score questions <laughs> like Buzz has. He has two, if you would like to hear them. Uh-oh. Oh, <laughs> well, gotta go. Gotta go. See you later. <laughs> Let me see. There it is. Sorry, I got everything you know kind of down around me. Um, let's see, Buzz. Uh, oh, talk about troublemakers. Oh, that, oh, that Buzz, you gotta watch him. You gotta watch him like, a, I, 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 I'll tell you, Buzz is great. He's so- yeah, You know, I should mention Buzz Delano, um, knew Keith for, for some other reason, and I, which I don't know, but 
went before three went on tour we went to la played mm -hmm. our first gig before we had rehearsed they said you know fanfare yeah i played in my little local band cover tune yeah okay and we'll do honky tonk train blues okay yeah, yeah. then we did satisfaction or something with a whole bunch of people at a record company party at the roxy and wow. buzz was there and took the only picture from that thing that first performance where we didn't even know what we we're going to play and then years later he sent it to me and we got to be friends i go oh my god this is fantastic i'm there with kevin cronin oh i saw her standing there kevin and i did uh, and keith's playing piano and carl's playing drum it was really something but it was gone forever lost forever and buzz comes along with a picture of it it's fantastic well that's wonderful buzz was great i mean I, I really enjoyed, I, I was hanging around with him at the last uh, NAM show. Yeah. And the um, fact is we, uh, funny story about uh, the two of us taking a ride back because it was so crowded and we we're trying to get to our car. So we took one of those bicycle caps. <laughs> yeah. Lights all around it and stuff and play the music and, um, he was like, um, I don't know, Mara Andretti or something. But he was going up the sidewalk. He was going up <laughs> past people. He was going into cars. And Buzz and I are just totally freaked out. It was, yep. it was Buzz will tell you, it was, it was a nightmare ride. It really was scary. And you wondered if you were getting back to the hotel. <laughs> I better answer his question then. What was his question? Um, let's see. Let me see. I'm trying to find it now here. Uh, I just saw it a minute ago too. Let me see. He's slippery, that buzz. I know, he's very slippery, but I, I absolutely love. Um, uh, oh, here it is. Okay, a couple of questions for to send to Robert. What's the best way to say blah, 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 blah? Hi, Dan. Here are two questions for Robert. One, what was Keith's mood when you last were writing with him? Mm, that, that's a good question. You know, I talked a lot about this um, during the Rules, Rules of Change release. And now at this last song, Never, it's called Never, on this album, it was a little bit tough when I delivered the album to Frontiers because, you know, I, you hold on to things. It's like in my world, Keith, I had this piece of music was sort of still alive and we had this thing together and now it's going to go out and that's the last piece I have from it, right? So when we were doing it though, and I've said this before, um, I felt like that was his happy place. I had no idea, none, that he was despondent in, in, despondent in other areas of his life. Sure, I, you know, he had played, and I always forget the name, the Live Wire Fest, whatever it was that ELP did in England. And um, people had sort of given him some bad reviews about his playing. And of course, like, well, Keith, he could still play better than me with one hand. I mean, are you really going to let that bother you? You know, and um, he said, yeah, it was okay. It wasn't as good as I wanted it to be, but it was okay. So he wasn't totally devastated about that. Um, again, I had got us a lot of money from Frontiers because they wanted this next three album. They had been bugging me for 15 years to do it. And I said, Keith won't do it. He just won't do it. People left a bad taste as well. They criticized it. They criticized him playing songs. They never criticized Carl because he played in Asia, which did songs, right? But they criticized, criticized Keith. And these but were the he was... Fans, correct? What? These were the critics, not the fans. No, these were a couple of guys that were fans that criticized when the first three in 1988, they criticized Keith, how dare you have female background singers in the band? You shouldn't have that. And that one guy posted at one time, hey, I was the guy that, that said that to Keith. Well, those things really bothered him. It, Keith was the best, not because of, he had an ego to be the best, because for himself, he had to be the best. That was who he was and what he wanted to be and who he was, right? There's nobody like him. Nobody practices in front of the fire with the keyboard backwards all the time. Come on, you know? And when people knock him down, he took it hard, you know? Yeah. But again, 
he this was his happy place you know i always say this i have the piano here in front of my pro tools if i could just turn it on come on how come you're not working <laughs> right when i need it to work it doesn't work right so you know we'd be working and he'd be playing me stuff he'd be playing him stuff we'd be compositing these things he had a lot of money coming from frontiers this was a happy place a happy time musically but then especially when we'd hang up the phone let's say to, like we're doing now we could well, diane you and i could write a song right now you put, pull your guitar out there i got my piano we could do it right oh, we could. and and i can record the audio and then figure out how to edit it around and then we'll perfect it later on but we could do it but i didn't realize lyrics i used to yeah. love poetry yeah so um and and yes was a big thing for me when um i was in the seventh grade and i i mean i was so into john anderson's style of mm. lyrics that I was basically in the same genre of his style. Yeah. Just making up my own lyrics. But my problem was this I didn't know how to put music to it. Yeah. That and, was you know, and there's sites for people that do lyrics and people that want their music that don't do lyrics. They put them all together now. I mean, it's, huh. it's done online, you know? Yeah. It's true. It's true. Anyway, Ke yeah. Keith was happy about this. You know, he really was. And um, it was other things that I didn't know about at the time. I didn't know that he just got uh, some a doctor had told him about heart impending heart problems. Yeah. I didn't know that he had sort of taken himself off of antidepressants. Of course, we all know that's not a bad thing or not a good thing to do. Uh, I didn't know those things because we were making an album. We were both like, God, this free. And then, of course, because of Rolf, hello, the three Facebook page. People were starting to say, hey, you got to revisit this album. This album from 1988 has some good stuff on it. There was a positive resurgence for what wasn't accepted, at least by the ELP and Yes fans, let's say back then. The pop world, you know, the rock stations and stuff, we had a, a top 10 song, so they accepted it, the, the new people. But it was the ELP fan of the day who was not ready for Keith to make that transition. So anyway, Keith, it was, it was good. He was in a good mood, happy. Um, you know, you might see in the uh, Powerful Man video that Keith asked me to go to San Francisco and him and Greg were, were touring just the two of them to be part of his documentary, which is going to be a great thing if that can ever come out. Yeah. The, 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 the tribute concert was OK, but nobody involved in Keith's band. Carl wasn't there. I mean, that, that's a whole different deal. But the documentary is real people and Keith being interviewed and stuff and David Woodward, I hope that it comes out at some point because there's some great stuff in there. Anyway, he asked me to come and be in it. So I'm sitting in the dressing room and Keith comes along. And goes, Robert, what are you doing here? Like he's a big surprise, right? And, and we talked about things, but he grabs my goatee at the time. He goes, Rebecca's a keeper, lose the beard, right? <laughs> it's a, it's... Made that uh, gift from? Were you guys yes. From? Yeah, yeah. No, it was such good memories. And now that never this song is on the album, once that's released and out there, and I think people are going to really love it. It's the last song on the album, so I have to get through the rest of the stuff to hear it. But they're going to love it. And it's a little bittersweet for me because that's the last thing I can do with Keith. Yeah. yeah. I remember being in the studio and looking at the um, keyboards and the piano. Keith had sat down to work on. Yeah. And um, kind of touched my soul a little bit. And um, it was surreal um, thinking that, um, you know, I'm in the same room with the great people. I've got you who um, who showing me around and all these different artists and then yeah. to Keith's area of where he used to hang out and that's yeah. we re three rehearsed here for our tour. We actually tore everything apart and rehearsed in the the big room, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I, I, I think I showed you the, the list that Carl is still on the wall in there where he had all the songs, the set list, and he had what had to happen with his electronic drums, all things for his roadie. It's still on the wall in there. 
Yes, I think you did show me that. Yeah. Yeah, that it's also surreal to me. It's just all like I've just gone back in time, and um, this is where Keith plays, and this is um, where Carl probably played, and yeah, you know, and you play over here, and you guys together were working on the boards and doing all the editing and. You can feel it when you walk in this room that, I mean, Greg Kins are in every Thursday. We're writing a new album. Uh, Gary Peel from Boston, Sammy Hagar's old band. They're always in here. David Lauser, you know, the guys on December people, you know, the tubes, you know, Fee and, uh, and Roger were in. Uh, it's been a year and a half now since we finished an album that was recorded in Germany, I believe. We we're mixing stuff. I mean, all these musicians. And then I collect everything like guitars and all the keyboards you know i have an old arp um 2600 the oasis that he keith helped me get i'll never get rid of that it's such a great keyboard the moog i mean i i keep all this stuff i don't get rid of it because it always comes back you know it's kind of like clothes right aren't bell bottoms in again or something you know so i keep it you feel it when you walk in because it's all still here yeah it is it's like um it's like studio slash museum. Yeah. If, if we were on FaceTime, people could see it. I'd open the cupboard here where the Steinberger that I got when I was playing with Steve Howe on GTR. And I said, Steve goes, oh, that's interesting. I haven't seen one of those. I said, yeah, Steinberger. I said, you want to try it? He goes, no, no, that's okay. Then I went to lunch and I come back and he's playing it, right? It's sitting right here. It inspires me. Um, a Strat that he gave me that, that he signed. Uh, Rickenbacker bass, a Chris Squire. Uh, signed for me that we have the same manager Brian Lane and Chris said I've never seen one exactly like mine as far as the feel and then and the year and everything you know um all these things are here and they all you can feel them you know it's just you walk in and it's a creative place with no pressure and things just flow it's it's amazing you just sit there you stand there in front of each one of these um base bases for me and Chris Squire just stands right out. Oh my God! And yes. just seeing Chris's signature on on this written book, it just yeah. uh, it's just uh, gave, gave me goosebumps then, and it gives me goosebumps now. And he didn't want to sign it. He goes, "Let me sign the pick guard." I said, "No, I want you to sign on the wood." He goes, "That'll that'll wreck it. In the wood, it'll never come out." Said, exactly. I mean. <laughs> McCartney and Squire, those are my two idols on the bass. They're both yeah. great at note choices. Yeah. Squire is more aggressive. I mean, I kind of, I like to play aggressive on the bass and his tone is cool. McCartney, just genius note choice and what the bass, it changed bass for everybody with what he did at the Beatles, doing different notes and walk, all the stuff he did is incredible. So to have that, and of course, that sits right next to my Hofner bass, which is like McCartney. These are all little things that mean something to me that no one would ever know when they walked in here, but there's Squire and McCartney next to each other, basically in my mind, you know? A picture of Keith, Carl and I from our video is on the wall from Sirwin Vega. No one knows that Sirwin Vega sponsored our tour and gave us all the speakers and everything we use and had stacks in the talking about video. You can see if you look at that, stacks of Sirwin Vega cabinets behind us that Keith and I used. And I have a picture that they used at the NAM show. You mentioned the NAM show that is the coolest transition uh, with dots and stuff of Keith, Carl and I, and one of our um, dancers in the video. Oh, yeah. It's so cool. It means something to me when I walk in, I don't even have to look at it. I just feel the support and the years of working with great people and the inspiration musically, it's weird because I, I always have ideas. If, if, like I say, if you want to write a song right now, okay, I like your Christmas tree. Let's see, what is that on there? Oh, candy canes. Okay, the candy canes on Diane's Christmas tree. You know, there's always ideas. You know, and I've got up here, I actually, I'm going to get up for a second here. I actually moved this over for something else I was recording. But well, it's a nice background. But of course, you know. Um, oh, yes. Yep, those are beautiful, aren't they? They really are. Where's Roberts? Now, you make sure you hang that up safely, because if it drops on my dime here, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I'm, telling you, I'm telling you, 
telling you, and I've got nothing but wood floors, so I can't drop it. You know, I guess that was uh, one of those things. If you think it, it's going to happen, and I thought it, so I'm sorry. I apologize. Put this down until I have three hands, because I do have just a wood floor, so it would break. Good okay. cat. More uh, questions. Okay. And comments. Um, let's see what we let's see what we've got going on here. Um, let me see. Huh. Um, Brian O'Sullivan. Rolly keyboard, I think it's called. Yes. Okay. And then we have Frank uh, Molchek. Is that right? I've never uh, asked him how to pronounce his last name. I call him Frank Mustang. <laughs> no, I don't. I just call him Frank. <laughs> he wants to know who he's wrong. <laughs> oh, another German. Watch out. And then Frank also asked for a very, will it be the same live band? Definitely. Good. I mean, first of all, let's take Andrew. Wow. I, I was watching and listening to some of the Circuland stuff. Mm -hmm. And Andrew came to me at a December People show in, I don't even know what the year was, but it was 10 years ago, let's say. And he comes up and he's a friend of my wife's brother, Ron Matthews. And I don't really know him that well. And he goes, how do you get back in the music business? You know, I've been a doctor for a long time. I want to get back into playing. I'm thinking, oh boy, another one of these guys, you know, they, they miss their twenties or thirties and their forties. Now he wants to get back in music. I said, well, you, Andrew, you just do everything you can. You write, you have to sing, you record, you, you perform everything you can. Son of a gun. If he didn't do all that and more, and then I'm hearing these albums. I'm going, this guy's really good. So I call him. And there's a lot of different keyboard players I was considering. But I needed a guy that not only could play great, but sort of needed to make a name for himself. So when I said, you need to be truthful and honest to the memory of Keith, this has to be done the way Keith would do it, not the way you would do it. Like if I asked Jeff Downs, which I, I wouldn't, but you know, Jeff's not going to really play for Keith or Jeff will put himself into it. And Andrew, I thought, as a new upcoming guy, good enough and smart enough and energetic enough and all those vitamins, you got to like that. Um, he said yes, right away. He goes, oh my God, that'd be great. Of course, then he listened to Carnival 9 for real and <laughs> realized what he had to do. But then again. He must have gone like this. But you know, I just, it's intuition, it's its fate, I don't know, I just knew that Andrew was capable of all that, and he's doing the Jordan Rudis version, that's really, really tough, really tough, so. I just, watching him at that uh, show in San Pedro, Pedro um, and just watching him. And the, the Roly is the black keyboard that he leans over. So you saw him playing that too. That's the Roly somebody asked about. Fantastic. And it's rubber and it feels weird and you got to bend it with your, your finger sliding over and stuff. And he plays that thing so well. It's amazing. Natural. And then let's not forget that uh, instrument that he puts over his shoulder. The guitar. Yes. Yes. The, the... guitar. Yeah, and he did that, of course, because Keith, Carl, and I both, of course, I had the bass, but Carl had a drum machine, the Dynacord, whatever it was called, rhythm stick, that was like a guitar, and Keith got a guitar, and we all got together in front of the stage. I got a picture here of that that is so cool that no one's ever seen, um, and first of all, Carl would bang on my bass with the drumsticks, and I would hit the, his uh, rhythm Dynacord thing, and then Keith would be jamming away. So Andrew wanted to have that kind of thing for eight miles high. So he got that going and then he had it painted special. And oh my God, he was so dedicated and still is. And, you know, and look at Jimmy Keegan. Uh, and, and again, Andrew's idea, he goes, you know, this guy, Jimmy Keegan's pretty good. So, well, duh, yeah, it's Fox Beard and he sings like a bird. I wonder if he'd be interested. I go, why would he, right? What a voice. Oh yeah. And what a player, you know, and. I called him, Andrew called him, and he said, I'd love to do this. No, I, 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 cool. And how do you replace a guy like that, that, a drummer that sings the high parts effortlessly 
wow. and can play all the stuff, you know. He, he can sing out um, when I was watching you guys kind of warming up or you just uh, yeah. putting your equipment together and you guys are just kind of talking back and forth and um, it was talking about um, you know, a song and Paul was asking about, um, you know, how do you go from one octave to the next octave when you're playing in, in, in this octave then yeah. Uh, Jimmy's like right there going, you know, singing it the same octave and then he goes up one octave and he is just on point. It's just like a, a no music, no nothing. He just sings it right out. And yeah. it's just so, You talk about Disney that I did, did, did stuff with. Uh, Jimmy was a, a, a Disneyland and kind of a Disney actor, musician. And of course, I think you know he's in a Sly Stone movie. He was an actor, child actor, and uh, yeah. he has all kinds of experience. That guy and his his stories and stuff are fantastic. But he's a top notch musician in every aspect. And yes. then you know you get on. You mentioned Paul. I've been with Paul forty years. I mean, Paul knows everything I've ever written. He's played every song. Um, he's been in every band, including three. He was our touring guitarist. Um, he's a perfectionist. Yeah, how can, he is. How I do, yeah, I could, how could I do that without a guy that knows me and the music that well? It wouldn't happen, you know? It'd be, uh, something would be different. And it was important to me that the band gave the audience what they had never heard before. The music they heard on CD, but live. And the, it needed to resemble that and at least be at a 90% level of what they were expecting because it's never been done. The, the GTR songs never done live before, you know, um, my solo career, uh, Can't Let Go from the Frontiers, my first solo album with them, never done live before. It had to resemble that. In, in, and it did. It was, and the live Prague Stock album. Not the prog stock was the high point of the tour as far as the, the, the crowd and everything. And meeting Michael Sadler from Saga. I mean, I love Saga. And all the guys, uh, Eric Norlander's last performance of Rocket Scientist. All these things. And these guys that I know a little bit, have heard of, whatever. They were all there. And our live album is really quite good. I have to blow Andrew's horn again because when you have the kind of keyboard rig he has, it's computerized. And everything is, um, it's programs in the computer. You know, the Moog is a model of a Moog in the computer because on touring, you can't bring all that stuff unless you're Keith Emerson. So Andrew has it all in there, probably a thousand different synthesizers and sounds in his computer and all the keyboards trigger it. Well, an hour and a half before we were to go on for a headlining slot on a Friday night at Frogstar, all the software became unauthorized. The stuff was dead. He had nothing. An hour and a half before we're supposed to start. And he was really stressed. He got on his computer. He started authorizing all the software, blah, blah, blah. We were about 20 minutes late starting. He, I can't imagine. That'd be like all my bass strings breaking on the first note of the, of the set. And I had to replace them. I'd be a little rattled, you know. Yeah. He played. I don't know how he did it. But when you hear this prog stock, dvd you see it he's smiling he's playing carnival nine you know no one else to blame uh, talking about he's got it all going i'm like son of a gun that guy he just put it out of his mind and said i'm gonna put my positive thinking cap on this is what i love to do that was two minutes ago that it was stressful this is now it's an amazing performance i, I remember watching um watching you guys and you were up to your last song. And of course, Andrew starts out with um, the Carnival Number Nine yeah. famous intro. And you know, I shut my eyes and I felt like I was listening to Keith. I felt like I was back in 1970. Um, the crowd around me that, were, that was at the club. Um, you know, they got kind of quiet and they had been talking like we were at a 1970 concert I and mean, people were talking about past experiences and <laughs> what's going on. And, and, you know, being in, a, in the nightclub, 
didn't matter because you just get pushed back into time. And I mean, I got these tears of memories and these tears of complete joy of listening to that intro alone. And I knew I was going to be in for a party. I just knew it. I, I absolutely was just like, this is going to be amazing. And it was. You know what was really nice for me is Magna Carta Records is what I did Carnival 9 and Roundabout and Minstrel in the Gallery. Uh, and I reworked them to have a tougher rhythm because that's what I like, the drums, the bass and the guitar, you know. And Carnival 9 was definitely that. And of course, Jordan Rudis did the keyboards on it. But people didn't come to see us like we were a tribute band because we weren't. We were playing my versions, which were totally worked up differently, but paid respect to the original. Yeah. And they, they, they liked them. They came, they didn't say, well, you ruined Carnival 9. They said, God, I've been wanting to hear that live, you know, and I love what you did with that. And the band really was just cooking away. And the reward, Diane, I, I can't even tell you, uh, for the first time, people are come up and saying, I'm so glad to get to see you live. You know, you've been part of the soundtrack to my life because I I've, I've have your music. And sure, it's not um, ELP numbers. There's not a 150, half a million people saying that, but I don't care if there's 150 people in the place we played and one person said that. To me, it was like, wow, I, I never really thought about that. You know, you make an album, you know, people buy it and they listen to it, but here's, people are listening to this in their headphones, in their room and living wherever it is and it means something to them besides just oh i bought this album by robert berry and it was you think i would have felt that before but it was different for me really different you know i know for me um listening to the way you played it and the changes that you made um the complexity of changing um you know the tempos and um, just, just everything that you that you did a little different that you can tell was just so challenging to do, um, and, and and fun. It was it was a puzzle, like I, December people. It was a puzzle, you know. <laughs> I I when I when you guys finished that song, I felt so alive, and it, it, I felt like. This was a great arrangement. I mean, it was the same, yet it was different. So yeah, you right. lost that Carnival 9 uh, song sound and meaning, but yet you put in your own twists and turns, and yet you didn't lose any of the, um, of the uh, what do you call it, the original that's where, yeah, the, what the writers and the players, and, and that's the trick to it, you know, so many tribute albums, you know, guys will just recreate the song, well, who cares, if, if I'm going to hear, like there's been a Yes tribute album out lately, and there was an ELP tribute album, I think, out a year ago or something, well, who wants to hear, I, I'll listen to Keith, Carl, and Greg, thank you, I don't need to hear some other people doing it exactly the same as original, so it's give me something to keep, like I always thought, I, I know Keith would like this. I know this is, especially when Jordan Rudis did, because they were friends, you know. Oh, I know he would have loved this version of Connie. Yeah. Anyway, it, it was good to do that. It was great to be able to play the GTR stuff that had never been played out. All that stuff was just tremendous. And so many people, because um, we had a lot of merch there, because I, I brought everything I, over the years that I had left over, you know, and people were in the line and it wasn't about selling them stuff. It was about connecting with them and shaking their hand and thanking them. And boy, I tell you, across the country, it was, I still can't quite explain how it made me feel. And cause I really hate seeing my name on the marquee. I don't, I don't need that. I, I get to do music every day. I'm rewarded in exactly the way I'd like to be rewarded. I get to do what I love. And I don't care if it's working for Mickey Mouse or it's, you know, <laughs> do, doing the tube stuff. I love it. You're doing what you love and you do it well. You, you are multi-talented 
you, you play everything from drums to keyboards to bass to guitar. It's amazing how many instruments you can play and you sing beautifully. It's, um, it's a big package for you. Oh, here we go. Another check I got to mail out. Jeez. <laughs> hey, speaking of checks, we have uh -oh. a couple of more um, comments to make here. We have somebody, I think his name is Paolo uh, Rigoli. And um, Paolo, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, I'm very sorry. Um, Robert, will you consider playing live in the fabulous track, Last Ride Into the Sun? Mm. That was, you know, I've spoken about this a lot because for me, the new guy to have, a, I think our talking about went to number seven, top 10 US, that was pretty cool. I built a house off what that album and that song did for me that year. Yes, um, the, the, the rest of my friends here in town and music, um, they still enjoy playing music, but that was like a badge of honor for me that I finally, it's not, again, it's not about the money, but I was dedicated enough and did something enough people liked that I called it the house that Emerson built, right? <laughs> I couldn't help it. So here we are and they call me and they say you know keith doesn't want to do this anymore because of the criticism well like and in those days there was no internet 1988 89 no internet and these guys get letters to him how why do you have girl background singers it's cheapening blah 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 i go what business is it of yours how keith emerson decides to present his art you know and remember greg did the folk songs greg made a lot of money carl played in asia asia made a lot of money elp made a lot of money but weren't as wise with it especially keith because he was all about the art you know he'd buy a motorcycle on the corners because he wanted to and you know he needed to make a better living like carl had so keith wasn't selling out he was just changing stream like yes and genesis and now keith and carl were anyway it's all last ride into the sun yeah yeah it's a that's yeah he uh they call me and said, Keith, I don't want to do it anymore. You have to come to England to dissolve the company. I said, okay, well, I'm going to write a song that's going to make them not dissolve the company. So I did Last Ride Into the Sun, and I worked my butt off. I had these rehearsal tapes and stuff from when we were getting uh, the out first album ready. It had some stuff that Carl had come up with, um, some stuff that Keith had come up with, and I wrote this Last Ride Into the Sun song, which I thought, how could they resist? This is what we should be doing. And I brought it there. And I said, before we have this meeting, I'd like to play this song because I, I think we have a reason to continue going. You know, it's financially important. It's artistically important. People like it. I didn't have any idea these guys had written Keith a letter, you know, two of them. So I played it and Keith looked at me. He goes, <laughs> I still kind of laugh. He goes, Robert, that sounds like me playing. <laughs> and it was me, right? Because I wrote it with the band. You know, I, I knew what we were about. I knew, I thought I knew where we should be going. And I had a vision and uh, Carl was supportive. And I said, well, Keith, just think that's me. I, I can't do what you do. Just think how great it's going to be when you get a hold of it. He goes, no, I'm done. Just, I, I gave it my best shot because I think that's, that song is you take Desi La Vida, Last Ride Into the Sun, and now the new one, Never. Those are the epitome of what at least Keith and I can do together. And uh, I'm glad somebody mentioned that. To play that live, I, I had I, the first time, because it starts this little bell going, thing, I started to cry. I went, oh my God, I never thought I'd play this live. And I'm <clears throat> verklumped, I think is what you call it when you can't sing. And I got to kind of pull it together i feel it right now even as i'm talking about it yeah yeah you, you can i know i felt it a few times during our our talk here and in fact this let's see um uh, robert uh schindler says uh yep it was a panic backstage i guess he's talking about uh andrew and his uh 
trying to uh, get his uh, system worked up when we were yeah. talking earlier. And we have um, Terry uh, who goes back and says, kind of like being on stage in the middle of a song and half of your rig suddenly shuts off just before your solo. Yeah, exactly. That's where Andrew was before the whole show and he worked so hard to get it ready, you know? Oh, so. brother. And Rolf comes back and says, Gary, let's see. Um, I can't really read that. Gary. Uh, Probably Gary Peel from uh, Boston. Thank you. Joining Robert in uh, New, ha New Hampshire. Oh, yes. Jerry LeFaro's place. And meeting Hush member Glenn Gates were also were there also. Were there. Yeah, you know, that was, I got to say, we were in Canada and um, you know, I, I try not to talk about this, but I was really just stupid um, with a couple managers. When the rules had changed, had come out, I got contacted and Andrew got contacted. The two of us were talking to people because I need someone to back me up. <laughs> and he's a smart guy. And we had this guy that was... Uh, vice president of Poly polygram records at one time say i gotta manage you guys this is tremendous i mean you know this is going to be really big everybody loves the album and i bought into it i thought gee he was with a big record company one time it cost me ten thousand dollars the guy did zero I wish you could see me zero i mean i'm not exaggerating he did nothing but cost me ten thousand dollars and i felt like such a dope but then um, we said, you know, there's this guy that knows how to make a tour happen and uh, got a hold of him. He goes, yeah, I'll do it. I feel like a dope again. No accounting, no contracts, nothing still to this day. So that said, that's all fine and dandy. I'm not too old to learn. I can still learn. I think it happens to all musicians. At uh, another I guess. What advice can you give um, these musicians that are watching this um, interview that uh, either haven't had that happen yet, would like some advice as to how to avoid that from happening? Well, you know, one thing, a rule that I live by, except for I didn't when the first manager approached me because he was vice president of Polygram Records at one point, is... If somebody says they can do something for you, make you money or you know, realize your dream, whatever, they should know that they can make money off it or they wouldn't be contacting you, right? There's money, you know, like Carl Palmer said, don't be afraid to make a small profit because I'm not, the, the money thing kind of bothers me a little bit. You know, I don't do it for the money. I have to get paid to have all this great equipment, but, and, you know, tour and pay the band and all that. But I did not do my due diligence with the first guy and i was impressed that he's a vice president of a record company at, of, of promotions or whatever a certain time and he wanted this money to make things happen well you know if he thought he can make that much money on me the way he's selling me on the whole thing i shouldn't have given him the ten thousand dollars to make this happen he should say look i'm going to take 20 percent of it but i can make this happen let them invest their money because I've already invested my art in an album that's out and doing really well. So that's always a problem when someone says, oh, well, I can do this for you. It's going to cost you this much money. Then it's just a job. You know, you want someone that believes in your art and thinks that they can do maybe, but let's say somebody wants $2,500 to promote your album. Well, that's not very much money, really. So yeah. if they really believe in you, maybe they can make 10,000, maybe 25,000 if they really push it, if they think they can make it, you know, and sell 50,000 albums, you know, they have to believe in you in a different way than just getting a paid for this line item. I like That's it. one thing. Uh, the other like thing it. is don't follow your intuition like I did, like, oh, oh this guy was a vice president of, you know, this has, yeah, I thought, well, oh, God, you know, this, he's connected. Yeah, that was a mistake that I shouldn't have made. I should have checked him out thoroughly. I should have, I did give him um, checkpoints that he had to hit. I set that up. You did this, 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 this. And then as they came across and you had an excuse and there was this, how we're going to do this instead. 
I fell for it. You know, set your goalpost, set the line that gets you there and make sure you hit it. And if you don't, you know, we all want to hear what we'd like to hear is the problem. And I'm no different. I want Diane to say, oh, that song, I love that song. But if you say, you know, I don't care for that one so much, but I like that one. Well, I can take that. But I'd rather hear you say, oh, I like, oh, everything you do is just wonderful, right? I mean, that's, we're all like that. We want to hear what we want to hear. And that's a problem with human nature, I think. And I'm guilty of hearing what I wanted to hear. <laughs> you know, I think that we're all like that in whatever we're doing. I think we're sure. all like that. And you know, the whole idea of, I really like your advice about, um, you know, someone asking you for money because it's just like anything else that could be a scam that, mm -hmm. you know, oh, we're gonna give you $50,000, but we need $10,000 from you first. Right, I've, <laughs> I had a, a scam from England. Some band wanted to come over here. They said, we're gonna send you this money and then we just need you to give 5,000 to so-and-so. I thought, okay, that seems weird though. I didn't do it because it just felt weird. But what happens is exchange rate changes and that costs you money and you've paid somebody else and they cancel everything out. Oh my God, there's all kinds of scams. Yeah. You asked me about, about that. I want to say LaFaro's, um, Jerry and, and Kathleen out there where Gary Peel came and Glenn Gates came. Um, we came from Canada. The, the worst gigs I've ever played because of the management. And um, he could not make this promoter over there step up and do what he said he was going to do. And it was, I mean, you're going across the border and you never know if you're going to get back over, even though it's Canada and it's all safe. And I have friends over there, but um, so we're driving all, oh, it was an eight hour drive to get to the Lafaro's place. And we get there and it was just magic. It was the best gig after having the worst gigs you could ever have. Um, and not, not that the people in Canada were bad. It was just the promoter and the way the venues are set up and kind of being out there on our own with no help. You know, the people came, but it was just really weird. Um, the Faros were great. The venue was great. The crowd was great. And they were right in our lap, this little stage. And it couldn't have been cooler that it was like that. It was really fantastic. Um, we made some good friends then. They fed us in the morning. We showed up for breakfast in their home. It was just really the greatest. It was really super. And Rolf was there. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> that's where we learned how much trouble he was. And Dwayne Farrell came with him, a, a friend of mine from, from California here that we'd become friends through the music. And um, Dwayne printed me a book of his time. He came to five or six dates with Rolf and they did the merch and they helped us with everything. And he printed me a book of the photos he took and dropped it off here at the studio. It was, it's, it's sitting here. If, like I said, if I could show you things on, on the, um, the video here, I would. It was such a tremendous gift because it's from his viewpoint of coming out with the band, hanging out with Rolf, which is, that's risky business there, you know. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, you always got to keep an eye on them. Oh, you know it. I'm, I'm, if, I, if nothing else, I've learned that. I might have had two bad managers. And by the way, I have a great manager now. And he came to Prague Stock uh, from England. He said, I've come here to write for Prague Magazine. He goes, best set, best music. I just love it. Um, congratulations. Shook my hand. Went home got a hold of me after the tour is over. He goes, I'd like to talk to you about something. Well, he manages Big Big Train over in England, which is a band we don't know much about here, but they're huge. Well, they're not huge. They're a cult following that's doing really well, which is more important than being huge. They can still keep their artistic integrity, you know? Okay. And he goes, I'd like to manage you if you're interested. I went, so I checked him out and he's the real deal. He's been very successful in business. Again. He didn't say, it's going to cost you 10 grand. He goes, when you make money, I'll make money. And I like that. started working with the record company uh, on my behalf. And 
became part of the team. I, it was a blessing. I guess I had to learn <laughs> a couple of hard knocks just to really appreciate the management now as much as I do. His name's Nick and uh, he's just a really good guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And thank you. You know, Ralph, Ralph is, is, is definitely keeping up with what's he's, going on. He, he's got his meter running. I know what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> well, he says, uh, ask Robert about the upcoming song, Emotional Trigger. Oh, Very man. Juicy. What's it about? Where did that come from? This was pre-Trump era where social media has gotten much worse, right? But it used to be, I like to watch CNN and uh, I would look for things for song ideas and uh, the local news that was going on. I used to like those shows because there was no, at least to me, they didn't have an underlying political viewpoint they were trying to push you in that direction. And the news was still really bad, right? It was emotionally, um, well, I hate to say it, but there's things like, um, yeah, what would it be? You know, school shootings are terrible, but they would try to make it as, as bad. You know, we had one a month ago, you know, it's not bad enough we have one right now. We had a month ago and the, the whole world's gonna, and they would sort of, as they do, tug at your emotional heartstrings. And I said, my God, this, this is triggering me emotionally to write songs I don't want to write, kind of. You know, I don't want to be all doom and gloom. I, I want to be positive, like, not, say, not to bring this down, like coronavirus. Okay, there's a vaccine. We're going to, if we don't get it even till June, okay, so another half a year, uh, we're going to get it. And if you don't want to take the vaccine, you stay at home, take care of yourself. If you do, you can get out in public and live normally, hopefully. But that's my hope. There's no guarantees, but my hope was positive. I'm going to live normal, right? And back then, you know, this was written. I wrote this and sent it to Keith. I said, I was talking to him. I said, this song is made for you and me to do on an album because it's Oscar Peter Peterson kind of jazzy. It's got a stand-up string bass, jazzy piano, nothing like three at all. But Keith did a lot of stuff. There's nothing like ELP, right? He did... Yeah. Hockey Talk Train Blues. That's nothing like ELP music. You know, I love it, right? Greg did a lot of stuff, nothing like ELP. Folk songs, but it still fit into ELP. And I sent it to him and he called me. He goes, this is really good. He goes, you don't want me playing on this. I said, what? Like, you should do this yourself. Your voice and your piano is the perfect fit. And he was so complimentary. I just kind of hung on to it. And then because of the emotions of this album having Keith and I's last song on it, I thought, you know, that emotional trigger song that applies even more now than it did 10 years ago whenever I, had, I played it for him. I'm going to rework it, make it even better, and it's going to go on this album. And it is totally different from anything I've ever done on any album, let alone a three album. So I'm really excited. You know, I had a song on the last album called This Letter. It was a, it was a folky kind of tune, like Celtic kind of ding, 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 all guitar. And I thought, people are going to hate this. But at the end, it goes bombastic with the Emerson kind of keyboard stuff. And the first interview I did, um, oh, I forget the name of the Goldmine magazine. I think it was the very first interview. I said, well, you haven't said what you like on the album. He goes, well, I got to tell you, he goes, my favorite track, what? This letter, what? You're kidding. The one I thought everybody was going to hate because it's all acoustic guitar to start with, right? So I'm completely expecting for people to say, this emotional trigger song, eh? why do you put that on this album? It doesn't fit. But we'll see. What do you, you never know. I mean, Rolf's the only guy. The video he did with um, brain cell surgery, right? They have um, Takata, which yeah. You know, Carl going nuts with his synths and yeah. um, Jerusalem. But then they worked in the sheriff, right? And it's it's like totally opposite 
of what um, the album was, was, where it was going and everything. And you didn't make throw this in. And you were like, whoa, Western. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that, that's the thing about being the kind of artist you want to be. You, you have to do the things that you're inspired to do. And the days of White Snake and all that packaged, you know, journey and all that, um, that sort of changed with the new music. It, there's all kinds of different stuff going on. It all seems to have an audience. Um, there's still a great 80s kind of thing in Europe for the White Snakes and even Asia of the world, you know. But artists can stretch out a little bit more now and do what they want to do in so many ways that we're seeing some real creative stuff happening. And, and progressive rock seems to make a resurgence now. There's a bigger audience, younger too. Yes, and you know, I think that with Prague, uh, the more people that get involved with Prague, the more variety they're going to see on all kinds of different bands where they mix and matching. And it's not all one uh, genre of music. It, it, it's broken up a little bit. Maybe you get a, um, a love ballad. Yeah, and then they're doing some, some you know, more aggressive stuff with um, big sound and whatnot. So yeah. it's, it's, I like it. I really like it. Like, um, what album? Well, let's see. I'm trying to think now of uh, EOP's album with uh, Lucky Man on it, right? Yeah. I mean, they weren't all the same type of songs, the same music. It just kind of comes out, you know, Greg's um, country. Yeah, definitely. Just In fact, <laughs> ELP wasn't the same kind of music at all from anything else that was going on, you know, <laughs> totally you different. Could expect, you, you never could predict. That's right. What they were going to do. Yeah. But I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And even, even yourself, when um, I saw you guys, um, I couldn't predict what you guys, how you guys were gonna play things. And it was just so awesome. I will never forget that night as long as I did. Well, I sure wish we could have been out this year again after the European thing or before it, we we're gonna do some more dates. I wanted to get down to Texas, you know, Southern uh, United States. We did the East Coast, we did the West Coast. Um, yeah, really. And, you know, I wanted to get more to the Midwest, too. There's some real great you know, venues there and a lot, a lot of good music loving people. And uh, well, we have to talk because, you know, Southern California is like, you know, that's your, your stomping grounds. But, you know, the concert you want in your garage, it's not going to happen, Diane. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I was hoping to put you guys all out in my patio. There you go. Everyone. Everybody can have a chance to hear this great sound and um, come over and we end up having this big party with barbecue and, you know, let's do it up. And I'll get my first two managers to pay the bill. What do you think about that? <laughs> like yeah, it, huh? Absolutely yeah. brilliant. You know what? Buzz has one other question that I didn't even get to yet. And um, let's see, Buzz says, as soon as I get in here. Okay, does third impression really include the last piece you wrote with Keith? Might, might there be more? Yeah, you know, and, and I've said that it's the last one and people probably think, oh, he's got other stuff tucked away, you know, I have, stuff in on rehearsal things for three keith carl and i that maybe was never heard before um but a real song you know something we actually worked on this is it i mean it's sad for me it really is um that's why i'm, I'm saying this is not only the last song the song never which is almost 10 minutes the last song keith and i ever worked on it is also the last three album in the in the style because i feel like I can't do it without Keith, at least some ingredient. And now, you know, emotional trigger was something that he and I talked about too. He just liked it the way it was, but at least it was, um, he, he had his fingers on it, you know, um, and never is it. I have nothing else. I couldn't honestly do another three album plus three albums for the band three. It's poetic to me. Um, 
I, it's been the best thing I've ever been able to do, the best guys I've ever been able to work with. It's rewarding, but I want it to be honest. So from here out, I mean, the next album I do will be a little bit more like a GTR album, probably the perfect blend of guitar and keyboards, which is what Asia is, right? Perfect blend of guitar and keyboards. It, it will head that way. As you can see by my writing, Fond Farewell, I am so inspired and impressed and imprinted with Keith and his sound that my fingers just kind of do that. Um, the chord formations up, it, it's the really hard, fancy stuff that I, I can't do. But, the, you know, the big fat sounds, all the stuff that he's known for and all that is part of my DNA, too. So yes. I can imagine, yeah, what I do in the future is going to have hints of that. But like I said, it'll be more like, I think, more like GTR. You'll hear some more Celtic stuff with Keith and I also share. I, I produce this band Tempest, who's fantastic. And Keith played it on one of their records. Um, you'll hear that the first song on the new album is called Top of the World. And it starts, it's all along guitar, acoustic guitar into a more Celtic. And the manager and I, Nick, we picked that because we want people to put that on and go, Whoa, what? This is all acoustic guitar. What's going on here? And then they get through the album, which has a lot of the three style, and they wind up with never. But it starts with this Celtic acoustic guitar thing, just to change it up a bit. But no, this is the last song. Definitely, um, there's nothing else that I wrote with Keith that I have. It's a, it's sad, bittersweet. But then again, it's time that three has the three albums to its name. Are you going to um, start a new series of albums after this three, the power of three, um, third impression? In this one, I split the streets and uh, people are able to buy it. Um, do you continue to put out albums that uh, might have a little different, um, little different genre? Not much because I know you're proud, as uh, yeah. many of us are. Um, but um, maybe without. Um, Keith's, not Keith's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, not Keith's, um, not what Keith has, what you have about Keith's in the heart. In the, yes, yeah. Um, it always stays. But will you write uh, a little bit more um, on your own, kind of branching out with what you've learned from Keith, but and what you, what you have in your heart to keep, but um, not necessarily with any of the music is what I'm getting at. You, yeah. You continue on. I, I think you'll hear that on this album. This, this is half like the rules have changed in the style and half um, just whatever the hell I wanted it to be. <laughs> and I, I'm hoping that three fans and ELP fans will come along with me and like it. And like, like the first interview with a guy like this letter off the last album, I go, what the hell? You know, I didn't expect anybody like that, but I had to do it. It was me. And of course it was me saying, well, Greg got to do a uh, folk songs, acoustic songs. I'm going to do one. Right. <laughs> it's a little spoiled. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'm really interested to see what people think of the little bit of transition that's caused by this album, because that's, where I sort of land on my own. You know, because you have a style that is so, it's, it's addictive. It's, it's wonderful to listen to your changes and the way, you, the way you feel and see things and the way you write, it's, um, it's fabulous. Well, and I appreciate that for sure. And I, I already put the one check in the mail. I guess I'm gonna have to do another one. Huh? <laughs> I'll be expecting those, you know. I'm, I'm sure you are. <laughs> I'll be checking that mail a couple of days there, you know. <laughs> now that um, it would be, it would be very exciting to start seeing, you know, Robert Berry's and his band, and and have your 
It's in your head. You know, well, you know the, the three thing is, it is funny because to me, like I said, I was half the songwriter of the team writing the songs and I was the voice. And I feel like three is the real me. It's just that I've tried to keep the Emerson piece of it alive. But Keith and I both changed from the original uh, three sound that we wanted more I, I won't call it dance rhythm, but hard, tough rhythms, you know, in the drums, the, the beats uh, different than the, the first three album. And we already made that transition together, which we sort of agreed on. You know, he liked um, Celtic music. He liked marches, you know, he liked the drums pounding. So we actually already made the switch to what is more me because it was more him too. I, it's just that it had that Emerson style to it, you know? He put that thing that only, only he does. I mean, he, he puts these parts in and it sounds like him, you know? So it won't have that. But the style, I don't think is gonna drift all that far. It'll have some, it'll have you. And, you know, you have your own skill and talent. Well, here's the other thing now. We got December people, which I've been doing for 10 years, you know, and I do have a, a straight rock band called Alliance that I've had for, oh my God, 25, right from after three, from 1992, there's more than that, okay. So as far as my um, straight rock side, which I do like, you know, uh, doing that, because I like uh, singers like Lou Graham and Don Henley and stuff. I like singing that bluesier stuff. Um, Gary Peel, David Lauser, myself, we're working on another album right now. And you know, you've seen the December People thing. Next year, there's going to be a new December People album. And uh, we do that for charity every year. And hopefully we can play next year and do some good again. Right now, we're just giving away the uh, Up on the Rooftop just for people's enjoyment and get, get some smiles on the faces. So, I mean... I would say every month I write at least two songs for something every month. And every year I put out an album within my career. Um, I always give myself a couple of weeks of studio time here that I don't have clients in or I'm not working with a band I'm in to do what I want to do for me. And um, yeah, I'm, I've been doing that right now. In fact, I have about eight new songs written that are, I don't know, Hopefully we'll hear some of those. No. <laughs> the 3.2 third impression is the most important thing to me right now. It's been a mission of mine, you know, and of course I only have one song, but it's 10 minutes to let people know, especially with the rules of change, that Keith still had it. He had not slowed down. He was still creative. Um, he was involved in, in grand, cool music and that flowed through his uh, his mind and his fingers you know it just it it was something as important to me because i these reviews on him that he could play like he used to and all that stuff they hurt me too because i knew it hurt him and i thought they're damaging a a, a guy that doesn't bake his base his life on the ego of it they're, they're hitting him right where he lives what he believes in with himself, you know? So anyway, I don't want to get too deep into that because it gets a little sad for me, but. Um, you know, they, they started out the whole, their whole business with the songs that they chose to play wasn't, wasn't based on selling albums. It was based on going to concerts and, and doing these songs in a concert. Um, that's what they were going for was to sound in a concert. and. Um, that um, was very different. You know, most uh, bands were playing for albums. And I think that Keith uh, is being so flamboyant and amazing on stage. You could, you could I've, I've obviously posted a couple of pictures, you know, here and there. Not, not many. Um, <laughs> And um, some of those pictures of Keith, you can just see it in his face and body language. 
how he is so moved by what he's feeling and what he he's was, not what he's hearing. He was also a goofball. <laughs> he, was, he loved to make people laugh. Didn't he? Yeah. He was a goofball. Yeah, funny guy. He really. I remember. Really that day, that was that was hard that day to get that kind of news. I, I feel very fortunate that I got to work with him again. You know, we'd stayed friends through all the years. Like I said, I went to be a part of his documentary and different things, but um, except for playing on a Tempest album and a couple of things, you know, that were more like jobs for him. Um, we hadn't done anything creatively together. And I feel very fortunate that toward the end of his life that I got to be part of it, you know, with him. And, uh, that, is, that is very fortunate. Yeah, it's just, anyway, I don't want to, I'm getting all sad again. Anyway, we've been talking for a while here. I'm not sure how long this is supposed to go. I know, right? I mean, you know, let's see. I think we have one more thing from Rolf. <laughs> well, that's okay. Rolf's a good guy. He's, um, he, uh, he needs a job, I think. He just needs a job. He's just, you know. He says it has a very modern production sound. Now, I'm assuming he's talking about the emotional trigger. I don't know. Right? I'm sure he's still there. Is, is he, uh, is it in German? Are you translating? Or is that? <laughs> no, it's coming across uh, in English. No, it, Rolf's here, by the way. It's a... Uh, Frank, that's in Germany. I'm just, I just, I kid Rolf all the time. He, you know, you, you got to keep these people in check or they run away with all your, your money and your albums. And, you know, yeah, it's a whole album. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, the whole album he's saying. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what he's saying. The whole album. Um, you know, I, it's hard for an artist, at least I think to judge their own work. Like I wouldn't have put Fond Farewell out as the first single and it was the exact right thing to do. The record company picked that. Um, it was good. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I feel really good about the recording quality, the, the, the lyrics of the songs. You know, I'm a, I like to write positive stuff. They're not all positive. You know, a little bit of negativity in this one, or a little bit darker, but still not not too bad. And I think it's, I don't think it sounds like a throwback to what we do in the 80s. I, I, I believe that it has a fresh uh, sound to it and people are going to like it because it is a tr little bit of a transition. You know, I mean, three itself, Keith and I would have developed. If he would have been around to see how well the rules of change had done, he'd be totally feeling better about everything um because nobody would have been saying well he obviously isn't playing well they'd be saying oh my god yeah. emerson's look what he's doing right i mean they said that about me and i wasn't keith just think if it was keith they they it it'd be incredible it would have been perfect the timing was just a little bit six months too late you know and um, I'm thinking that uh, the same thing would have happened. We would have moved forward in some way. Uh, Keith had told me he wanted to uh, uh, get an orchestra involved. I, I would have tried to not do that. <laughs> but, uh, that's expensive. Boy, talk about not making money in the music world these days. That would have been tough. Um, but yeah, we would have evolved because Keith, you know, he kept up with a lot of things. I mean, th some of the stuff that I've, have in even on this is almost heavy metal riffs that came from Keith, you know, yeah. heavy stuff. I mean, look at look at what Keith played in. Um, what is it called? The Boys Club. Yeah. And uh, the way they did um, Nut Rocker. Mm -hmm. That's very heavy rock and roll. Heavy. That's right. You know that we we all evolve it until we don't. Right. And that's the problem with some bands. They get to a certain point that it's just kind of used up. They're not inspired. I'm inspired. I mean, I see a lot going on that makes me happy, makes me sad. Um, I'm fortunate because the way I write is I have to finish a song 
that's why I play so many instruments. I, I hear that uh, the bass line needs to be this. So I'm, oh, I'm going to write this. And these words are coming across. Oh, and if the drums did that during. And so it all kind of happens at the same time. Mm. So I get a lot of songs uh, written. And I'm also fortunate that, I mean, I've done two songs in the last few months for this girl who's just started college. So she'd be 19. Um, they're a little bit hip hop, Cheryl Crowish kind of things. It's new music, right? I keep up on whatever. Um, I get to work with people because I'm capable of doing what they need, kind of. So I'm inspired every week by other musicians, too, that are doing what they love. It keeps me creative. I, like I say, I'm never at a loss for an idea, and neither was Keith. Yes, yes. Now, you know, Rolf um, has sent another message, and he wants to know, who's keeping who in check? What, him or me? <laughs> um, I'm not sure I should mention uh, Rolf has a new girlfriend, so I don't think it has anything to do with me. <laughs> anyway, now I'm really in trouble, but uh, I, I had to say it. He probably knew it was going to come out sooner or later. People are going to know. He's very popular, you know. Uh, you know what I want to do, Diane, before we, we close this off, too? I want to say that Rolf is incredible. There's Ian Tasker in England, incredible. These guys that are running the three and the 3.2 um, Facebook pages and things, um, William Haney, uh, but there's one guy missing and that fond farewell really uh, could have used him. And I, I, in one way, the song is, could be dedicated to him as Ed Morgan, we lost him. Um, had diabetes bad, went to the hospital, a little surgery, and didn't make it through. And Ed was famous in his own right. Everybody knows Ed. He was the Otter King. He was a sweet guy. He came to the 3.2 tour because my brother-in-law and, and Michael, his, his good friend there in Florida, uh, made it happen. And we treated Ed like royalty. And I'm so glad that we got to do that because he was a wonderful guy. Uh, he won't be forgotten during the third impression release promo the tour hopefully next year um ed will be with us um we just need him to, for the the pr so it, he's had to have gone to heaven i mean most of my friends are in hell so i can't get a message to him because they're in a different area but um he's up there in Yes. I th here's the problem. I'm not so sure Keith went to heaven because <laughs> I, mean, I have stories. <laughs> but um, you know, hopefully him and Ed are, are talking. But I, I I miss Ed, and I wanted to mention, uh, especially to this ELP fan base and three fan base, that Ed is not forgotten by any of us, and uh, we we cherish the memory and the positive everything that he brought to all of us. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, Frank says, uh, let's see, rest, uh, rest, Rolf, when adults talk. <laughs> oh, that. Rolf says, Frank, uh, let me see, I have to do a trans translation, translation here. Frank, who are you calling an adult? <laughs> <laughs> Those, they both speak German, so yeah. Yes, and of course, Rolf says we miss Ed. Yeah. Um, and uh, Wayne says, just imagine what Keith could have done with an iPad and some of the new apps, some tied to uh, Ludus, yeah. uh, such as GeoShred with the Swam. S W A M instrument sigh, and then Wayne uh, Campbell says, "Rest in peace, Ed." I will say about Keith working with the new apps on the iPad and stuff. Um, you could barely get an email back from Keith, let alone a text, or him getting on a website. Uh, he wasn't technology challenged because, of course, the Mo was <laughs> hard to use, but. Um, he probably had nothing to do with that. He, Keith was a real player. And uh, I, I just don't know how he'd uh, have responded to all that. He'd probably check it out because 
they'd want his name and the product and stuff. He'd say, oh yeah, I see how it works. And he'd never look at it again. He'd take that little tiny cord keyboard, he'd turn it around backwards and he'd start playing it from the, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. That's my, my theory anyway. <laughs> and then pick up the phone kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, Robert, I don't want to say goodbye. Oh, Diane, we can do this again. Let, let's when the album comes out and people are either liking it or disliking it. You know, I like whatever it is. I don't expect everybody to like what I do. I learn something if they are at least honest about it. Um, and, and they say, oh, you know, I didn't care for that. You shouldn't be doing that jazzy uh, emotional trigger song. You know, no one into your jazz and rock and roll. I, OK, yeah, that's great. I don't mind. I mean, I, like I say, not everybody's going to like everything I do. I, I do appreciate it when people are, are kind about, about things. And I got to tell you, they've been so kind about Fun Farewell and the video and everything. It's been... I'm not kidding you. The, the um, professionalism of the uh, camera work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And just the timing of everything. Yeah. Um, amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Absolutely loved it. I know we have to go. I'll, I'll say one thing about the video. They sent it to me. Say that? What? You know me. I would not say anything that was not true. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. No, you, you're you mean. Come right down to it. You'd be very mean. <laughs> but fond farewell. They sent me the video. And here's this guy dancing around. Last guy on earth, evidently. Everybody else in the space station. And he looked pretty happy-go-lucky. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. It gets all the way to the end. The space station blows up, and then he looks up, and the girl appears. I said, but he looks happy the whole damn time. So I sent back to Frontiers. I said, I love this, but somewhere he should throw a chair against the wall or something. He's the last guy. He's got no friends. I mean, he should be unhappy. And they put in that scene where he's looking at that little monitor, and the space station blows up, and he clicks it off like no hope. Right? He turns it off. And that was genius on their part because I felt the emotion of this guy just lost hope. And that wasn't in there to start with. And I'm like, wow, they, they got my viewpoint and they did one thing, such a small scene that made all the difference in the world to me, to this happy-go-lucky guy that's skating around saying, oh, great, I'm the last guy on, on earth, you know, no big deal. <laughs> but now that's because he had hope. And at that point, he has no hope. It was really, really cool he did that. Anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Okay, well, I like that. And then, then just wrapping up here to say, say goodbye, we have um, Wayne that says, uh, fond farewell and uh, great job. Thank you both for the interview. Uh, Brian Sullivan, thanks Robert and Diane. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Well, Happy New Year and Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. And um, uh, we have Rolf saying 10,000 YouTube views in the first week of Fond Farewell. I wanted to add another zero to that. So maybe we can uh, get people to share that damn thing. <laughs> we will. And, you know, next time maybe um, when we have our interview, maybe I'll be, you know, back in the studio. You never know. You know, it's, it's been remodeled since you were here. It's been a while. Yep, and got a brand new board and some different lighting in there. And uh, I, I got a new, I got a new guitar. Did you? Yeah, 131 now, guitars. <laughs> well, I want to see it. So maybe next time we do this interview at your studio and I come on down. And is your daughter still in Pleasanton? Is that uh, where? In fact, this, she's got, a, she's a paralegal and executive assistant, and she did, just got a new job in a very large law firm, and, um, and then she happened to be in Pleasanton. So yeah, that's because you visited her last time, and that's what, and you said, well, come by the studio. We'll show you the studio, right? Because you were driving, driving back and forth, so. Yes, and it was like, for for me, we've lived there our whole lives there in um, the Silicon Valley, and uh, 
you know, it's weird coming down here to Southern California at first, and now I just really love different. So I remember the last time I came down for an interview, I totally forgot about traffic. Oh, yeah. You know, that traffic at that time of the day, it just never stops. <laughs> it always stops, actually. It's always stopped. And, yeah. you know, it was just really surprising. Uh, and I don't know why it was surprising, but it, it, it was surprising to me. And I was just like in this panic. And, you know, I'm just, uh, the kid, my kids are, uh, two of my kids are still there in San Ramon as roommates. Very good. Um, and I'll be visiting them again here real soon, so. Um, oh, you're not coming down here that soon, forget it. We just talked an hour and a half. That, <laughs> That that's it. I mean, I think <laughs> you'd want to have my vaccination first. Oh yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you know what? That's looking good for everybody. So I'm. I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. And Diane, I appreciate your time. Merry Christmas to you. Yeah. I I love it that the tree is behind you. You look great. You got your wet red sweater on. You know, you're. Yes, I got my 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 red uh, Christmas uh, spirit going on. Yep. And yep. Um, I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas, you and your family. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank you from Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Titans of Prague. We all want to thank you for your generosity and your the time that you take from a very busy schedule to, to, to talk to us and to let us get a little, a little more insight about throughout various and um, the people that surround you. So. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I would be nothing, honestly, without the ELP fans, because that's what launched my career. So, I mean, I, I'd be playing in a local bar, right? That'd uh, be it. <laughs> well, well, we'll see. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. But um, <laughs> I uh, do thank you very much. I know we've spent a lot of time here, but it was worth it. <laughs> we can't help it. We get talking and there's just stuff to talk about, you know? Oh my gosh, Robert, if I was down at the studio, we'd be talking another hour. Yeah, really, yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> it's all <my> well, <laughs> I appreciate it. I sure appreciate everybody uh, chiming in some questions. It was, it was great. Uh, it was really great. familiar names and uh, people that have supported my career and it, it really have become friends even though it's on facebook on instagram or twitter whatever you know it's still people long term and that that's pretty cool i like that and it's all within the realm of music and mustangs right frank <laughs> absolutely and um and everyone if you are not a member of the titans of prague uh Come on over and get your membership so that you can see this video or tell somebody else about this video it's because I keep it in a archive library for the Titans members. So we definitely want to make sure that um, you have access to this and all of our interviews. All three of the other ones, Robert. <laughs> yeah. And Ian John Tasker over there in England is going to be all over this. So. Oh. What, is he sleeping right now? He, yeah, maybe, you know. <laughs> yeah, he's he's been a, such a big supporter of mine and a good guy over there that really helps spread the word. And um, again, and just none of those people that just become a, a good friend. You know, it's amazing. Really, really cool. This is something what Facebook does, uh, and especially EOP and Prog, um, I call I call our site families members, not yeah. members, because we 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 all seem to uh, bond, and yeah. it's such a great feeling. It's such a great feeling, and yeah. um, even even the musicians like yourself that will come out and say, "Yeah, let's talk." Yeah, it's awesome that you normally would never have. Definitely. I'd be selling papers on a corner. Do what? I'd be selling newspapers on a corner. <laughs> yeah, and there's no newspapers to be sold now. That'd be a tough job, huh? <laughs> you think music stuff? 
<laughs> okay, well, we should sign off here. And I actually have a, um, a session. I have to do, put some uh, tracks in sent to me from Canada in a song and, and get them a mix. So I'm going to do that now. Right. And Robert, we're going to say goodbye and Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. And um, we all wish you the very best at, on your album and your video. And we'll be talking next year. Thanks a lot, Diane. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye, everybody.